So my name is Warren Togami, and I'll be talking about um, exchange security, um, not only uh, protecting like the people, uh, but also the business. Um, this has been a topic of interest uh, recently. So uh, I have uh, some credibility when it comes to security, largely from my previous career in open source software, um, where I've been working on the Linux operating system, um, first with Fedora and then Red Hat for many years. Um, and kind of related to security is a problem of open source spam filtering. Um, it, after that, I did an MBA and various um, uh, security consulting. I later became a Bitcoin developer. Um, a few years ago, I was one of the three co-creators of the Scaling Bitcoin Conference to bring this um, like academic rigor to, um, to the Bitcoin industry. Um, I hope um, all of you are attending that conference from tomorrow. And in 2015, I joined Blockstream. Um, I happen to work at that company. We do things relevant to the crypto exchange industry. Um, but this talk has nothing to do with Blockstream. Um, so. so a general problem, especially with the business type people, is that they see all of this marketing for security products and security brands and they do not understand that security is a process, not a product. It's not something that you can buy. It is a philosophy or uh, a culture practiced by the people. It's far more than only the technology within a company. And with Ordinary business, um, like security is often not taken seriously because you can often recover from mistakes or uh, errors. But when it comes to cryptocurrency, errors are not reversible. So the consequences are far more dire. Uh, now, uh, security can slow down feature development but if you are lacking security, then your years of hard work can be instantly destroyed. Uh, so I'll talk about a, a few recent hacks uh, from this industry. Um, like what happened in these incidents and the later slides will, will be about mitigation measures that could guard against these sorts of, of attacks. Um, so in 2012, um, this is very early in the Bitcoin industry, there was a exchange called Bitcoinica. I, I wasn't around in Bitcoin back then. So like this is only what I read from Google, but um, Apparently what happened was a, a virtual uh, machine provider called Linode, um, their customer service infrastructure was hacked and, and the attacker searched for any reference to Bitcoin among their customers and um, targeted the virtual machines of eight customers and stole all of the Bitcoin they could find in, in their the largest of which was an exchange and um, were robbed of 43,000 Bitcoin, which now is a lot of money. So I talk a, um, a lot more about cloud security um, a bit later. 2014 um, was a incident where uh, spear phishing or a targeted email attack uh, was used to compromise the email of the executive of BitPay and then the attacker was able to see that the way Bitcoin tr uh, transactions were manually authorized was with um, a um, 
was with email. So uh, using that, um, they uh, sent fake email and tricked the executive into sending 5,000 Bitcoin to the attacker. And these deep, and the details of this hack were later released due to a lawsuit between BitPay and their insurance company. Um, so that is along the lines of a combination of social engineering, like fooling someone, um, and and targeted attacks um, at like someone's browser or an email client. Uh, to compromise their system or their email account. Uh, 2015, there used to be a prominent uh, altcoin-only exchange called Cripsy, and um, where exchanges like this would add every altcoin in existence with no quality standards. And unfortunately, one of these altcoins had a back door uh, and they had a lack of isolation within their, their server infrastructure and this led to, to, to total compromise and theft of, of the other coins. Now, these examples were known in public I happen to know other examples of hacks that were detected and thwarted before damage happened, um, where an entire data center was targeted to go after one customer. Um, but luckily detected quickly and no losses happened. Um, or a very common attack in this industry is mobile number porting theft. Um, in fact, I know several people in this room have been targeted by this attack. Um, it's not only the people at an exchange or people who work on cryptocurrency software, but like even non-obvious targets like their spouses. Um, because like they're trying to get information in order to use in social engineering attacks against the people involved. Um, or I heard of an incident where uh, email Trojan was sent to an engineer and managed to compromise their laptop, but luckily due to um, precautions in, inside their company, this was caught very quickly. So this is a, a survey of things that I'm aware of. There are many other examples, and I'll go over um, uh, risk mitigation measures. Only some of the exchange hacks over the past few years There are many other considerations when it comes to security, and I skip over some of the really obvious ones like physical security. So um, in those examples before, I talked about detection as one means, and like for those who, do, um, who have done system administration, um, A thing that I often see is that they will only set up the server and the application such that it works, but then that's, that's where they stop. Or maybe they'll lock things down um, to be a little bit more paranoid about what the application is allowed to do. Um, one of the names of this is called the, the least privilege principle. The most common example of this is with firewalls, where you, you close everything, like all of the TCP and UDB ports, and then you open up only what you expect the application to do. So like a web servers and port 80 and port uh, 443 only. Um, now, for incoming connections, that's where most um, sysadmins stop. 
Um, but if you are really aiming to protect your infrastructure, then you want to go even further than that and, for example, block all outgoing connections except for the specific resources that the application or operating system actually needs. And that requires a bit more research and testing. Um, so similar to network level firewall lockdown with least privilege, um, there are um, even more fine-grained uh, me uh, means of locking down resources. Uh, with mandatory access controls, like um, the a very good uh, mechanism in the Linux operating system is SE Linux or, or Security Enhanced Linux. It, it's also known as that thing with, where um, people will install uh, Red Hat or Fedora and immediately turn it off because it's a pain. But um, if you, it doesn't take that much to learn how to customize these roles. And um, in, in the documentation, it uh, even shows how to set the um, SE Linux to, to permissive mode where it'll only record what, what the system is actually doing. And then you can keep a log of, of, of all the resources that the application uses. And then you can run that log through a tool that will spit out rules for you. And then you can apply those rules and change it to enforcing mode. And that's not a, uh, like, I would say that's like a 99% improvement because if your production system is running in this way where the application is locked down to only what it's supposed to be doing, then you could be monitoring the logs and to anything that deviates from that behavior will look suspicious. So another uh, uh, risk of mitigation measure, um, okay, so like this is just like general uh, security for any company. Uh, there are some things that are very specific to our industry because errors are not reversible. And there are some types of issues where exchanges can become insolvent even without a hack of the exchange. Uh, because uh, we are all uh, so blindly reliant upon software made by by other people. Um, and the quality of that software um, differs substantially. So, um, so just one example out of many uh, from last year, uh, the Ethereum parity wallet, you know, um, uh, multi-signatures is supposed to be more secure but if you were using the, the parity multi-sig uh, uh, multi contract last year, twice all of your money was stolen or, or destroyed. And I haven't heard of exchanges losing money this way, but lots of ICOs lost a, a huge amount of money. And like this kind of thing, can easily happen again due to errors um, and the safety culture of the of how these uh, systems are are engineered. So, in normal software, the default is to write the software quickly and patch it later. And for ordinary companies, maybe that's okay because. Um, you can recover from from problems, but when it comes to cryptocurrency, this is I say this is an unacceptable attitude. Um, and there are other types of engineering where where um, this has been understood for a long time, like in aerospace. Um, like look at the history of rocket boosters and like how many of them explode at launch or 
1986 is the, the famous example of the Challenger um, space shuttle explosion um, that was later found to be, well, I like the way Nick Zabo put it in this tweet. <laughs> what happens when managers and investors ignore the, uh, the engineers and scientists? He's, in this tweet from 2015, he's talking about Bitcoin, but using Challenger as a, as a metaphor. Um, so blockchain's transactions are not reversible. Uh, the purpose of business is supposed to be business. The payment tech must be boring and a safety critical engineering process will minimize that risk. And that's why I talk about the Bitcoin philosophy of don't trust verify. Um, a goal here is to minimize the need for trust. And um, for years, I've been visiting exchanges and talking to people that work at exchanges and a very common problem that like many of the way people have implemented exchanges, especially years ago, is to query their deposit addresses against third party block explorers to look for deposits. Now there's problems with this largely of the type of you are trusting someone else's system and while only you are responsible for losses. And if, if you run your own full node, then the cost of auto, uh, automated verification is super low. So why trust a third party? Um, there are other elements to what I believe is the true meaning of don't trust verify. Um, and I think that like this, uh, um, as a philosophy, it uh, underlines the Bitcoin engineering approach and like it, it's not well understood outside um, where like Bitcoin is, is criticized for moving slowly. Well, there are reasons for this. Um, that have to do with the peer review process. Um, so, if you look at the pull requests in GitHub, uh, which is how code changes happen in, in Bitcoin, uh, you'll find examples. Um, I think like people in this room have a pull request um, 9622 that took seven months and 120 comments. Um, this, so this pull request, chain state DB, um, which turned out to be very important for security uh, reasons later, um, 245 comments. Like this is a, like only just examples of the extreme level of care used in, in Bitcoin engineering. Um, or uh, SegWit, 14 months uh, between design, implementation, review, and deployment in a version of Bitcoin Core. Um, or e even outside of the Bitcoin industry, people are aware of the security disaster that OpenSSL has had where I think OpenSSL was the beginning of brand names for security vulnerabilities, Heartbleed. Um, and this revealed that OpenSSL had actually had many other security issues that, that uh, needed a lot more attention. And the thing is the Bitcoin devs knew this years before and and had had begun on a a very narrow replacement for open ssl inside of bitcoin core um, and it took years of review and e even some formal verification um, for them to be 
confident and they have a high level assurance because like the usual rule in software engineering is you do not roll your own crypto, it's very dangerous. Well, sure, but um, you, you can do it very carefully and narrowly. And uh, by eliminating OpenSSL, they reduce the attack surface. So um, the first step of defending a company is to defend the people. And I gave um, like examples of those exchanges hacked by tricking people into opening emails um, that, that they shouldn't or um, like social engineering attacks like are typically used against like a phone company in the US to steal someone's phone number. It's very hard to defend against that. Um, so for example, if you're, if you're using a mobile number as a second factor authentication to log into services, I know people that, that have like a, pair, um, a, a second unlisted phone number under someone else's name that they use for that. Um, because you, you can't be too careful, especially when you're in this kind of industry. Or um, computers, Windows, Mac, Linux, um, the attack service is very large and um, like copy and paste, especially for, for cryptocurrency addresses can be very dangerous. So the defense for end users, not only for wallets, you know, like the ledger or Trezor, but also for, for two-factor authentication logins um, um, used by wallets like Green Address, um, Green Bits, um, or like uh, uh, there were hard, um, hardware two-factor solutions. Um, uh, there's a standard called FIDO that's implemented by, um, like this is Google's Titan key and other, Another popular brand is YubiKey. Um, you probably want to lock down your Gmail account with this type of, of uh, second factor security if you are in this industry. And uh, I don't have a good picture for server side hardware security but um, I show a, a little more fun example. Um, so um, I think earlier today, Taj was talking about um, lightning, but then like a drawback of lightning is that the receiver needs to be always online with the private keys. And that can be bad because computers can be hacked. Um, so, um, so that's a picture of the Lightning Network from like the middle of this year. It's probably much bigger than that right now. Um, like the website where I got this is gone now. Um, if someone has a better website, I'm, I'm interested. Um, so earlier, okay, March of this year, like someone took a, a little uh, system on chip and made this into a, a, like hobbyist uh, lightning node um, that isolates from the main system that's on the network, the private keys. And you could program a thing like this. Um, uh, like I personally worked on hardware like this in order to, to separate um, like a private key signing from a server um, for different use cases. And um, you can program rules into this uh, for example, only sign if, if the lightning balance would go up. Um, there's some, ex um, uh, some um, e uh, exceptions to that when it comes to balancing, which makes it more complicated. But So in general, um, when I mentioned the, wait, Okay, um, 
isolation of different software or hardware is very important. And uh, like the biggest example or like or the easiest example to use um, is the Cripsy hack from a few years ago, uh, where um, you really have to be careful about the software you download from other people. And I think in the case of this altcoin, even the back door was visible in the source code on GitHub. I'm not sure about this. <laughs> but it's, it's easy enough to hide back doors and only the binary, and it's not visible in the source. Um, but the information that the, um, like the experts at the time heard is that the security practices inside of Cripsy were very bad. <laughs> Um, where they were running all of these altcoin demons on the same machine, maybe even the same non-root account. I'm not sure about that one. Um, so, like this is like very basic and obvious, um, like security isolation measures that you should use. And and like um, I would design things such that you not only trust or or um, not only do not trust third-party software, do not even trust your own software. And that's where I recommend the least privilege. Um, and like there are all sorts of examples online better than this, but like to create security zones in your systems and one-way logging um, where you have a notification system. So the examples earlier of hacks that were detected were because of um, like audit logs and notifications um, to detect unusual behavior. And you want these to be as separate as possible. Okay. Um, I'm astounded um, how people do not talk about the extreme risk that the cloud has. Um, I've been working on operating systems for now two decades. <laughs> and um, I, like while working at at that company, I witness over and over again exploits, like a local exploits, exploits of the hypervisor, container breaks. And like this happens over and over again. And, um, and uh, recently there's Meltdown Inspector, which also were, were complete breaks for a, a virtualization. Um, like the idea of the cloud is you are sharing um, like virtual machines, um, like resources on physical servers, possibly with other customers. And any of those other customers of your hosting provider could break the physical security and get into the other customer's data. Um, and this is like even worse for containers. Uh, virtual machines have never been secure all these years either. Um, but the reason that companies use the cloud is because actually it's very convenient and it's great for rapid development. I entirely encourage, you know, like the current practice of developers um, using the cloud for prototyping and testing and non-production instances of their system. It's, it's okay. Um, it's great for on-demand capacity, um, great for cost control, but keep in mind how this industry differs from, um, from most normal software. We cannot recover from errors. So in general, you need to be aware and um, and to appropriately design isolation between systems, keeping in mind that um, that virtualization uh, simply is is never secure. 
and the cloud industry is sort of aware of this. Um, like I would stay away from the public clouds, like ordinary AWS or like um, in the case of the of the 2012 Bitcoinica hack, um, that was a hack of the, the um, Linode service provider, one of the earlier, um, like very convenient virtual machine uh, providers, like knowing full well how dangerous these things are. Um, some, some countries demand that the cloud infrastructure be hosted in their country and like the people in the company who manage those um, resources that they sell to governments like have security clearance for the, for that country and like you, you have to trust that the provider doesn't mess up. Um, it creates a larger attack surface for an insider attack um, for a, with a bunch of people you don't know by trusting these so-called secure clouds. Maybe it's good enough. I don't know. Well, like it's um, th these things are secure until they're not. Um, so I have friends that work at you could call them traditional payment companies in the United States. And like the consequence of a hack there is significantly smaller and recoverable in many cases, but they do not host their infrastructure in public clouds at all. It's only in-house servers. And there are, um, uh, platforms that 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 give you all of the convenience of of cloud for your developers for internal use, but but on your own hardware inside of your own company. So then you need to trust only insiders of your company, and hopefully that's safe. Now keep in mind it's secure until it's not. And other popular things for developers are um, like uh, Node.js, NPM, Golang, GoGet, is it? Um, Rust is, uh, I can't remember. Now. <laughs> um, so these are a very convenient libraries to, um, you just add them as dependencies to your project and then it'll automatically download usually the latest version of that, that dependency. And the problem is you have no idea what you're downloading. And you, di you did not audit this code um, in control of other people. Uh, the download infrastructure may not be safe. Um, there, there are very paranoid ways of using this. Like, um, for example, in Node.js, you can um, have in your packages.json, you can lock it down to specific hashes of particular versions. But, but nobody does that. Um, and like a related issue, this was last year for, for a while, like there were Trojan uh, things in the NPM library. Uh, I don't know, like I think there was even one case of, of um, like not uh, um, of, mainstream modules being a compromise, but I'm not sure about that. Okay, so I talked about danger of third party, okay. So another attack that um, always has been an issue is being able to hide back doors in binaries. Um, now the first step is like verifying if the source code is compromised. Now, no one checks the source code that they use, but um, maybe with careful peer review of the software that you use and the signed commits and like knowing the people involved, you it's it's kind of like social proof that, that, that the source code is maybe safe. Um, but, um, identified quite a while ago was that it's, it's possible for entire operating systems and compilers to be compromised in a way that's not visible in the source code. Um, one of the famous papers on this is by Wheeler in his um, 2009 dissertation. Um, 
And there are different ways to guard against this. They're not easy. But um, the Bitcoin developers were among the first to take this as a serious problem or to treat it as a serious problem and uh, pioneered a tool called Gideon, um, which uh, uh, the goal is to make binaries bit for bit reproducible no matter who builds it. And Gideon is pretty good, but still not safe because you are, it, it blindly downloads the latest version of Ubuntu and uses that to build. And you have no idea what's in there. Um, so due to this, um, the Bitcoin developers have been aware of that risk for years and have been working on a next generation deterministic build tool chain. Uh, there are people in this room working on this and um, other people attending Scaling Bitcoin um, in, in the next two days. They're not ready to announce yet. Um, but um, like this is, um, you, as our industry deals with larger and larger amounts of money where things are secure until they're not, we need to be especially careful about um, like the chance of this kind of compromise happening is very low, but it only has to happen once. Um, oh, and not in my presentation is the, oh, okay, is the risk of hardware attacks. Um, in the news yesterday, uh, there was a, a, Bloom, a Bloomberg article um, about um, state level attacks um, it, um, where a chip was inserted, not part of a design into motherboards. You know, like it takes a lot of time, effort and money to do that. But um, like uh, you, to be able to trust the supply chain of hardware, that's the problem described in that article. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the, the supply chain of software here. And we need to, to be able to fix all of these problems as we deal with larger and larger amounts of value where mistakes are not recoverable. Um, so you also heard her earlier today about um, atomic swaps and trustless exchange of different types. I don't, so I don't have to talk too much about this. This is the future, um, especially when you see um, like time and again, exchanges in the past custodial model who are responsible for customer funds getting hacked and losing it over and over again. Um, this runs the risk of regulators panicking and, and creating rules that are more and more um, draconian and um, that makes me wonder if the, if, the, if the industry will be able to move more towards a trustless model that shifts the liability to personal responsibility of the owners of the, of the token. Okay, so here's another, um, say crypto industry specific problem. Um, so when we talk about full nodes and don't trust verify, we want everyone to verify for themselves. And that's great if it works. Uh, the risk of consensus is if your view of the truth differs from other nodes. And this can happen, for, ex uh, for example, with a civil attack. Um, no time to explain it right now, just look it up. Um, or alternative implementations have, um, there's a debate for years about the wisdom of this. Now, the problem with alternative implementations is that they must be bug for bug compatible. Um, and it's really hard to be bug for bug compatible when bugs are not yet discovered and um, 
over the past few years, we keep finding more and more of these behaviors, um, like the BIP66 um, strict DER encoding bug um, uh, due to unexpected behavior in OpenSSL um, is one example from Bitcoin history. Um, so, um, where even two versions or, or um, two Bitcoin core nodes can disagree with each other. So, um, like probably the best we can do to guard like your company against this kind of problem is just to have paranoid diversity of, of verification. It's like you can use any of the full nodes that you are most comfortable with for your company, but you may, you also want to check with, with a whole bunch of different full nodes out there, like in your network, outside of your network, different implementations, older versions of Bitcoin D, your friend's node that is not managed by you at all. And if they disagree, then you may want to put a stop to certain parts of the business automatically until humans can investigate. Um, like, it's a disaster if you accept a deposit um, and through a, a flaw or attack, your view of the truth differs from others and a trade happens and they withdraw in some other currency and then your, um, your exchange is left in, insolvent. Okay, so a, a um, what I've um, done in my career for uh, like 20 years in open source is not only the development of the software, but also um, like organizations and projects to help the industry and the community to, um, to do a better job at this. Um, so a few years ago, um, I was a co-creator of the Scaling Bitcoin uh, conference series. And it, a more recent project um, with a few people in this room and other people in the community and industry is we're launching a um, education project. It, it, it's very simple. Um, the Bitcoin developers um, choose or, or write articles that explain something that's misunderstood and then it's, it's translated very carefully into the major languages of the world, especially languages where um, English is not very strong. And um, in some of these countries, there are not a lot of um, experts or there may be experts, but they don't have time to explain things. So if you are translating source material of facts from the experts um, very carefully, this sort of material would be quoted at, at, um, like, um, at, and used as source material um, in the media and all sorts of things in this country. And that's how, um, like this is very useful for developers in these countries to better understand and learn and, and to get more involved. Um, it's an opportunity for non-developers as well to learn more and to be able to help in the industry. Um, so in this room, I, I would like to introduce Ruben Somson, who's the, the education director of, of, of Reading Bitcoin. We are creating a nonprofit organization for this. Um, I, uh, we intend to be working with the Linux Foundation. The Linux Foundation has 160 other sub foundations um, for various open source projects. This is not a development, a software development um, nonprofit. This is only education. Um, so there's a prototype website at readingbitcoin.org, and then um, you can click on the language selector, and it shows what this site can be for Chinese, Japanese, Korean right now. Um, we need both individual uh, volunteers, corporate sponsors, and individual sponsors in order to do uh, 
to do a good job of this. Um, we tried to do this with only volunteers this past year, and to maintain quality of translations with volunteers is too difficult. Um, so I would encourage you um, uh, like to follow these um, accounts on Twitter, and then you'll see more um, news when, um, as we um, are, are bringing these online. And we need your help. So any questions? As for using uh, third-party libraries, is there any reasonable policy that you would recommend? Because not using any, that's going to be hard to sell. So where do you draw the line? Of course, this is not a simple problem. Um, like develop your application using dependencies and then um, like once it's ready for production, lock down to the specific versions of those um, dependencies and sub dependencies and sub dependencies of that and then like skim through the code, um, look at the diffs of those individual projects um, over time um, this is the sort of things that I've done at Red Hat because, you know, like millions and millions of people are dependent on this software that we shipped in this open, open source operating system. And we don't, uh, like we also took tens of thousands of dependencies made by other open source projects on the, uh, like out there in the internet for the last 20 plus years. So like there's no substitute for, for doing as much careful checkling as, as possible, but like really lock down to specific version numbers and even hashes of, of the dependencies. And it's really not easy. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, one of the big things that um, I've run into a lot with a lot of the projects that I've been working on is that if you offer an, a, a method for people to verify something, like for instance, GPG sign something, or so it's like if you want to trust us, then you can verify the signature and then you'll know that at least it's what we say it is. And then the trust only relies on us. But if you're not verifying anything, then you need to trust to make sure that nothing happened between when it came to your computer, no one was injecting something, and all of these other things. But I do find that if you do something like GPG signatures, and then the users, 99% of them don't check the signatures because it's too hard, or blah, 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 or some reason, um, then their effective security gained by GPG signing is zero. So what are your thoughts on middle grounds for everyday users uh, in the context of all these security methodologies that you've been talking about? So the first answer is personal responsibility. Um, like, especially if you are an exchange, you are a service provider or other people are relying on you. There is no excuse but to check. Um, now, for, end, for ordinary end users at home, normal personal computers and phones are not securable. You need hardware sec, um, security to, to augment that. Um, and the hardware wallets these days are pretty easy to use, and there's no reason not to use them. Uh, they do have a cost, but what's the cost of losing everything? Um, now, middle grounds in terms of like software you download, sure, ordinary humans do not verify GPG things. Um, and ordinary humans do not use deterministic tool chains to verify that things are what they are supposed to be. Um, but um, like Windows and Mac does, and like the way Bitcoin software is, is, is distributed in the Windows and Mac are signed by keys that are registered with Microsoft and Apple. So that's a middle ground that actually works until it doesn't. Well. <laughs> uh, 
uh, microphone. Uh, so let's assume it's 2020 and I'm running a lightning node or a lightning hub that has like millions of dollars in locked payment channels. Uh, what, what would you recommend uh, for me to sleep well at night? I mean, what are specific measures uh, would you employ uh, when you have basically yeah. like millions of dollars in, in what's a uh, hot wallet? Uh, physical security, mm, uh, very carefully maintained software operating system stack, checking for, um, like there's now open hardware um, that is not quite good yet, but um, there's like IBM release to open power that is pretty good and it's a little expensive. Um, competing with that is um, Risk Five by a consortium with like Google and a bunch of companies that that want there to be a royalty-free um, platform in the future. That like that'll eventually be fast enough, but then like supply chain of manufacturing, uh, I don't know if we'll if if we'll ever be able to fix that with reasonable cost. Um, but like things like this. It's like more than one computer and a very constrained communication between them that is very narrow, um, can go a long way as long as you have physical security. Um, like it could just be two PCs with a serial cable between them. And would, you, would you recommend that over a hardware security module with a custom firmware? Well, well if someone knows what they're doing, um, the, oh, there's no easy answer for this, but um, like this example at least has the benefit of being something that is very cheap that uh, someone could publish all the source code and the firmware for something like this and it, uh, the firmware can be uh, peer reviewed. Um, but for now, this is only at the hobbyist level. Any more? Yeah. Yeah. So again, um, we need your help, the help of your companies um, for the entire industry to do uh, readingbitcoin.org together. Um, please approach myself or Ruben if you're interested in helping. Okay. Uh, thank you.